Inside of You is brought to you by Sonos. I don't know how many times I have to talk about this because I, I love talking about this. But uh, if you don't know, I have, uh, if you're a listener, you probably do know, but you know how much I love Sonos. Uh, they weren't my sponsor for the 18 years that I had Sonos all over my house. And I kept asking Cumulus, uh, Agnes, and uh, Teresa over there to, to see if Sonos would be a sponsor. And finally, we got them to be a sponsor. I think this is, they have some of the greatest products there is around. I have, uh, a Sonos, you don't have, you know, the old days where you have like a, a, a giant, what do you call it? Um, Boom box. Receivers oh, and all these yeah. things in the house. You, you just don't need that anymore. Yeah, that's cool. I have a computer and I have Sonos. I have a, a small device in each room that plays music wonderfully, loudly, clearly, beautifully. Did I say beautifully? Maybe you, I did. You did. But uh, Sonos is fantastic. Um, share the joy of listening on Sonos this season. Make the sound system on your wish list a reality with speakers and sound bars that are easy to set up. So easy, guys. I, I do this. I have no patience and I can do this. They're easy to use and all work together so you can listen in any or every room and bring the family together with incredible sound for everything from classic carols to festive films. Sonos works with all your streaming services and control is simple with the Sonos app, your voice using Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant, and Apple AirPlay 2. Spoil the listeners in your life with a gift that keeps on giving. Treat gamers and movie lovers to an immersive home theater experience with Beam. Keep your fitness-loving friends motivated with great sound for their workout playlist with Move. And help relatives relax with hands-free control of their music and more on Sonos One. You've got to try Sonos. It will change your freaking lives i like i said i've got them all over my house and what's nice is i'll play uh you know some meditation music in the basement i'll just get my meditation on my yoga on if i have to um in my bedroom i'll have something chill that if i want to go to bed in the living room i'll have some you know some 80s playing kicking you know outside maybe i'll have a some jazz, I don't know, jazz. Some jazz? I mean, you could do it all with Sonos. You could play songs in each room in your house. It's wonderful. And all you have to do, folks, do me a favor. Go to Sonos.com. It's S-O-N-O-S, Sonos.com to learn more and wrap up your holiday shopping. You won't be sorry. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Hi, guys. How are you? Are you enjoying your week? I know you're driving. I hope. Hopefully you're smiling. Come on, smile. Let me just feel it. Are you smiling now? Let's do it. Let's just try to have a good day. Let's have a freaking good day. Thanks for uh, making me part of your day. Ryan Tejas is here with me. I am here with you today. And um, I'm not, I, not I, even I, in spirit. I, what? Not I'm, even in spirit. I'm no, here in no, person. You're, you're here in person. I'm here. And that's good. Yeah. That's nice. Um, I like having you. Uh, you have a good week? Yeah. Yeah. You did. I mean, think, yeah. Yeah. You have a good Thanksgiving? It's great. It was Wonderful. great. You love the family? Loved it. I love it's your wonderful. family. I don't know them, but I love them. <laughs> I love them too. Yes, I did love you, them too. <laughs> I love them too. <laughs> did you have a nice Thanksgiving? I did. It was nice to have friends over and, uh, you know, just we all sit around and we all say what we're thankful for. And I think it's important. You know, I used to think hokey, campy, cheesy, mm -hmm. you know, and then when you sit around and you say, hey, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for my patrons. I'm thankful for to have a job. I'm thankful for having Ryan here. I'm thankful for... It makes it just something to the brain. It's science. People have talked about this, doctors and everything, but there's something about being grateful and, and saying your your gratitudes that help. We've talked about this in the podcast before, but I'm I'm grateful for all of you guys. Um, so hopefully you had a great Thanksgiving. We're gearing up for Christmas, the Hanukkah season, mm -hmm. and uh, I like it. I like the weather. I like a little chilly outside. Don't you? Yeah, it's nice. It is. It's, yeah. uh, I like to go shopping. Yeah, I like uh, I like I like sporting the little hoodie. Yeah, a little, hoodie, nice. a little flannel. Just like a little, just like a little, yeah. little cozy. That's right. That's what I like to do. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for supporting it. Ryan, tell them how they could follow us. The hand, what are the handles on Instagram and Facebook? They are at Inside of You Pod on Twitter and at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. There you go. So you could follow us. You could listen to us. You could listen. Uh, you could watch us on YouTube. Please subscribe. Uh, if you're here for Nick Frost, if you're a fan of Nick Frost, I hope you'll stay around and listen to other episodes. I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll get something from them. I really do believe that. So hopefully you'll uh, you'll join me. And thanks to all the patrons who give back to the podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash inside of you. And you could give to the podcast more and keep this thing running. Thanks, Cumulus. 
Happy holidays. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, Jason, my editor. Um, today we have a great guest, Nick Frost. Uh, I, I am a big fan of Nick Frost. Um, and you know, his his partner in crime, Simon Pegg, they've done mm -hmm. a lot of movies together, mm -hmm. Shaun of the Dead, and uh the list goes on. But um, you know, he's he really has a great story. He has a book that's out and um he he speaks from the heart. It's not like some actor just telling you, like, here's my story. This is a guy who, you know, had some tough times and he opens up about it. He opens up about his sister dying. And uh, Nick, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you opening up and being so damn humble and sweet. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot from this podcast today. So without further ado, let's get inside of the great Nick Frost. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. What is it? Uh, that's uh, yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is. Indy. That's Indy. Gold Idol. Lovely. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Do you have any toys at your house, Nick? Do you have any toys? No. You know what? I don't have anything at all. Like nothing from any job I've ever done. Like when you go to Simon's house, it's like a museum of peg. <laughs> but like I literally have got nothing. Of any oh I tell, and I found like an old poster that Tintin poster that Steven Spielberg signed the other day I was like oh maybe I'll keep that oh you had Steven Spielberg sign your Tintin poster yes it was one of the big ones you get at the premieres when you walk in someone got got that and someone signed it all and it was in an office that I'd forgotten about and they said oh do you still want to keep this I was like yeah so that's the only thing you have all the movies you've done all the big actors you've worked with. You don't keep anything. You don't really care about that stuff. No, I never. No, no I, don't, I don't not care. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I have to I have to weigh up. Is it is it just going to be stuck in a fucking cupboard for a year? <laughs> and if it is, then I probably don't need it. I got I'll tell you what I have got when I was like 16. And like I had no money. And I used to go around, what do they call them in, in the States? Like, we call them charity shops, but you call them... Uh, oh, thrift stores. Thrift stores. Thrift, store. thrift stores. So I used to go walking around thrift stores with the aim of finding, like, a first edition novel and then being able to sell it and, like, eating. Really? <laughs> and one, one day I found the a first edition novelization of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So Spielberg wrote it as a novel. Why well, didn't know that? Um, oh my God, it's amazing. The dust jacket's pristine. And then when I got to do Tintin with him, I brought that with me to Los Angeles and I got him to sign it. And he was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I've never seen, you think he saw two of them. Wow. Did you get starstruck? Well, did you get have you read that book? I haven't read it, but I've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Okay, so you know the big organ they play at the end to communicate? Da, 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 da. So in the book, it explains that the only place in the world that the Secret Service could get a synthesizer uh, advanced enough was off of Stevie Wonder. <laughs> There's like a whole fucking scene where the FBI turn up at Stevie Wonder's house. <laughs> like in the book. It's amazing. No, come on. Honest to God. They go to Stevie Wonder's house. Yeah. And they like commission, like they, they kind of, they say, listen, we can't tell you what it's for, but we need one of your synthesizers. Does it take you out of the book? Does it kind of like, is it kind of goofy or it works? It, <laughs> it made it better. I wish Stevie Wonder had been in the film. <laughs> Now, that's one of your favorite films, right? Close Encounters? Uh, yeah, I fucking, I love it. I love it. I mean, I could, it's, uh, I'll watch bits of it now. I find the end, there's like a bit at the end before the very end that kind of lags when they're running up Devil's Tower and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're spraying that sleeping gas on the <laughs> birds or whatever it is. That, that kind of lags a bit for me now. But I now remember like my auntie, Melanie, who's a vampire, uh, she wait, wait, wait. She's a vampire. What do you mean she's a vampire? Well, she's never aged. It's really weird. And she never comes out in the day. Right. 
Uh, she just <laughs> gets up at like six in the evening and then sits up all night drinking tea and smoking and then is in bed all, <laughs> all day. She's probably in her 70s, but she looks, she looks like Kate Bush. <laughs> Kate but Bush. But she lives in a place in Wales that used to have um, an American air base. And so she used to date all the American service guys. And uh, she was dating this guy, and he got us onto the base. What are those things called in base? They're called PXs or, like, they're like shops that you can buy American food in. Right, I know like what you're talking Like, in Wales. So for, uh, that, that was the first time I ever ate a pizza. Like, he got us onto the base, and we ate pizza. How old were you? And then, uh, like, 10, 11. Right, right. And then one afternoon, we were at my auntie's house, and he came around with like a massive videotape, and it was Close Encounters. And so he like put it on, and we all sat and watched Close Encounters on VHS. So it's kind of a special memory. It's a special movie because that's like one of the first movies you probably yeah, saw. Can, we had yeah. pizza. I too. mean, it's, you know, you know what films like in television. It has that kind of amazing. I, I find it with old photographs too. You know, it, that's how we can time travel as humans. You know, because it. We can't physically travel, but you can. I can feel how I fucking felt when I was ten. You know, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, me and Simon, we when we did Paul, we hired a massive RV and we drove the whole route that the guys drive in the film. Right, and it took us like eight nine days. You know, we drove from LA to Vegas and then to Area Fifty One and up through Utah and and it was an amazing journey, but. The whole point was we got to Devil's Tower and then we walked around the tower with the soundtrack on our iPods. And uh, <laughs> and so it took us like seven days to get there. And like an hour before we arrived in Devil's Tower, he and I ended up having like a big argument. And then we ended up walking around Devil's Tower on our own. <laughs> All I that fucking way for that. I wonder what the argument was about. That's what interests me. Do you remember? Oh, my God. It was just shit. I mean, we haven't... What do we argue? I remember us... We've had probably had two uh, two really big arguments. I remember we, we shared a bed for, like, ages, for, like, a year. You shared a flat together. You slept in the we, same bed, you and Simon Pegg. Yes, Peck. yeah, we did. And uh, one night we were, <laughs> we were chatting, you know, before we fell asleep. And I was kind of craw I crawled down the bed on all fours, and he thought it would be funny to kick me off the bed, and it just went really badly wrong. It just, <laughs> and we just we had a massive argument, and then we kind of went we went to bed back to back and just fell asleep like that. <laughs> oh my god! Just pouting. Not even looking at one another. My, who usually starts it? Who usually provokes the other the most? Well, we're different. See, he. I don't know. I'm different now being a 50 year old man. I've had to let a lot of those resentments go, you know. Right. But when we were much younger, it was, you know, I guess, uh, I don't know. Simon's very clever. He's very good at arguing. <laughs> he's not always right, but he's good at arguing. Do you know what I mean? Right. So it can be quite, quite frustrating arguing <laughs> with Simon because it's like, I'm not going to fucking win this, so I might as well just shut the fuck up. <clears throat> you know, uh, the late Carrie Fisher, I was friends with her, name drop, but she used, to be, <laughs> she, she used to be married to Paul Simon, and she said they would get in these vicious arguments together, and he would say some of the most brilliant, fucked up, distorted, clever th things during their argument that she would say, I'll be right back, and go in the other room and write them down. Yeah, because she couldn't believe what he was saying, so she would write those clever. Uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty amazing. So it's one of those things where he's just really clever, and you're like, "Fuck, I can't win with this." Fuck, fuck. you. Yeah, exactly. You know, you and I met in a at a convention in Australia. Yeah. Right. Do you do you go to a lot of the conventions, and how do you like them? Um, well, I haven't been. I mean, because of COVID, that's kind of shut that part down for for the time being. Yeah. Um. I really, I've got to say, I mean, in theory, I should fucking hate going to conventions and, and meeting people and 
smiling and well know. why is that why is that are you an introvert you, you feel i am yeah i'm uh i've got adhd so i find it difficult to get out to leave the fucking house sometimes you know um kind of lots of weird anxieties and you know but but i i, I really like it i really like doing it you know it doesn't it never really feels like work. I mean, I, I know you get tired and you get paid for it and stuff like that, and you can never. I mean, as, as you, I mean, you, you've done. A, you're really professional at these things. You're always lovely to everyone, you know, and that's. I think that's the key to make everyone feel like they are special for that minute, two minutes. That, that, that. right. Also, I'm really aware that that they potentially pay a load of money just to come and see you and to have a photograph and. You know, I, I, I'm always aware that that's a, that's a factor, you know. Right. Because some people turn up, they want fucking 10 pictures and loads of things signed, you know, a cricket bat, and it's like, dude, it's like 400 bucks. It's poor you. <laughs> do, you uh, do you do that thing where you kind of give, like, go on, have this one, have that one, you know, I'm, I'm terrible like that. Oh, yeah. If someone comes in and goes, oh, I don't have any money, I'm like, just pick something. Just fucking grab something. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. everybody yeah. that's listening is going to go, I don't have any money. I And then... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> That's but a- there's a lot. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of amazing that in terms of my fan base, wherever I've gone in the world to do a comic con, the kind of people are always the same. <laughs> like you know how? what I mean? It's, they're all exactly the same person, and I kind of like that continuity. There's something uh, like watching Close Encounters. I know how it works. Right. Right. It's sort of like the same fans. Like, you know, you have that fan base. People, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, The World's End, Paul, that kind of that kind of feel yeah. to it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the genre geek. Yeah. I, and that, you know, I mean, I think they get a sense from the stuff we do. And it's, 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 I mean, it's correct in a certain aspect. But we, I mean, that was us. I mean, we are fans. We are fans of the genre and... You know, I love close encounters and science fiction and Star Wars and Star Trek. And, you know, it's, I, I like it all. So it's, I get it. I understand, you know. Inside of You is brought to you by Sonos. I don't know how many times I have to talk about this because I, I love talking about this. But uh, if you don't know, I have, uh, if you're a listener, you probably do know, but you know how much I love Sonos. Uh, they weren't my sponsor for the 18 years that I had Sonos all over my house. And I kept asking Cumulus. Uh, Agnes and uh, Teresa over there to to see if Sonos would be a sponsor. And finally, we got them to be a sponsor. I think this is, they have some of the greatest products there is around. I have uh, a Sonos. You don't have, you know, the old days where you have like a, a, a giant, what do you call it? Um, Boombox. Receivers oh, and all these yeah. things in the house. You, you just don't need that anymore. Yeah, that's cool. I have a computer and I have Sonos. I have a, a small device in each room that plays music wonderfully, loudly, clearly, beautifully. Did I say beautifully? Maybe you, I did. You did. But uh, Sonos is fantastic. Um, share the joy of listening on Sonos this season. Make the sound system on your wish list a reality with speakers and sound bars that are easy to set up. So easy, guys. I I do this. I have no patience and I can do this. They're easy to use and all work together so you can listen in any or every room and bring the family together with incredible sound for everything from classic carols to festive films. Sonos works with all your streaming services and control is simple with the Sonos app, your voice using Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant, and Apple AirPlay 2. Spoil the listeners in your life with a gift that keeps on giving. Treat gamers and movie lovers to an immersive home theater experience with Beam. Keep your fitness-loving friends motivated with great sound for their workout playlist with Move. And help relatives relax with hands-free control of their music and more on Sonos One. You've got to try Sonos. It will change your freaking life lives i like i said i've got them all over my house and what's nice is i'll play uh you know some meditation music in the basement i'll just get my meditation on my yoga on if i have to um in my bedroom i'll have something chill that if i want to go to bed in the living room i'll have some you know some 80s playing kicking you know outside maybe i'll have a some jazz, I don't know, jazz. Some jazz? I mean, you could do it all with Sonos. You could play songs in each room of your house. 
It's wonderful. And all you have to do, folks, do me a favor. Go to Sonos.com. It's S-O-N-O-S, Sonos.com to learn more and wrap up your holiday shopping. You won't be sorry. Inside of You is brought to you by my good friends at BetterHelp, BetterHelp Online Therapy. Boy, I can't tell you how much this works. I get emails all the time. Thank you for talking about BetterHelp. Thank you for getting me into to therapy. Ryan does BetterHelp. I do. I just, you know, uh, I just had a friend this morning. I was FaceTiming with him, and his wife said, you know, my kid's uh, dealing with depression. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know any good therapists? I go, well, better help online therapy because they're in the middle of sort of nowhere, and you mm -hmm. don't need to go anywhere. You can FaceTime or text or you know, it's it's better help is just uh, it's amazing. It's it's helped you out. Yeah, it's uh, it's convenient. And, it, it's uh, convenient. Yeah, yeah it, it has been good. I have gotten a lot out of it. Well, I like that. Look, whether you're struggling with grief, relationships, or stress, or having trouble sleeping or meeting goals, online therapy might be for you. BetterHelp is secure online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with a licensed professional therapist. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own accredited therapist. You can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. And you don't have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. Therapists have a broad range of expertise, which may not be available in your area. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime, folks. Send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if you need. And that may happen. You know, you, you meet someone the first time, you may not vibe with them, you change a therapist. BetterHelp it's that easy, and I, I completely recommend this. Uh, so many people have told me it works. Uh, it's more affordable than traditional offline therapy by a landslide, if you ask me, and financial aid is available. Visit betterhelp.com slash inside and join over the 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp, Ryan, that they are recruiting additional therapists in all 50 states. Inside of You is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com slash inside. That's BetterHelp.com slash inside. Give it a shot. BetterHelp. Inside of You is brought to you by Home Medics. Guys, you know I've got a, a rough back, a rough neck. I've had lots of surgeries. I don't necessarily sleep that well, but... Uh, Home Medics really makes great products. They sent me this back massager, and you could prop it up against a wall. You could lie flat on it, and it's so deep and just penetrates the hell out of you. It it really just it, it just helps me after a long day. I'm all knotted up. I'm tight, and uh, oh, oh baby. Home Medics really did it. I, I swear, Lally came over the other day. If you don't know Lally, he's one of my best friends from childhood. I go, dude, lay on that sucker. And Lally's like, no, I'll do it later. I go, no, bro. Do it now. Do it now. Now. And he lied on. He's like, whoa. That was his reaction. Just uh, <laughs> fantastic. Um, Home Medics really knows how to make great products. And Home Medics has a slew of products. They've got a whole line of massage products from a massage gun with built-in hot and cold technology to a massage cushion that lets you lie down or sit up, like I was talking about, depending on your therapeutic needs, to a three-in-one foot massager with vibration so powerful it loosens the muscles in your legs and lower back. Moral of the story, Home Medics has massagers that address your pain points from head to toe. Um, I love this product. I use it. Uh, I could, I could honestly say I used it and love it and it works. And so now I'm telling you, and you know what? They also have an a plus better business bureau rating. So, you know, they're a brand that you can rely on a plus a plus. Wow. So you can join the millions of customers who trust the home medics family to take care of theirs. Whether you're dealing with chronic pain or just looking to help your muscles recover from a workout, we've got good news. Right now, if you go to homemedics.com slash inside and use the promo code inside, you'll receive a free portable phone sanitizer 
when you buy $100 or more in massage products. That's a $60 value. That's Homedics, H-O-M-E-D-I-C-S dot com slash inside and use the promo code inside for your free portable phone sanitizer with a $100 massager purchase. Now you were saying, you know, you suffer from ADD. I, you know, I, I, I deal with the same stuff. I've, I've dealt with yes. it my whole life. I get overwhelmed very easily. What, what is it that do you, have you dealt with depression your whole life and anxiety and things like that? And, and what, what do you do for it? Yeah, look, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's only really in the last kind of three. Look, I mean, uh, I think I, sorry, I'm just trying to think of a, a nice, you know, look, it, I think it's from the age of like, 16 I just suffered a lot of trauma until I was 40 you know literally uh you know violence and death and people dying and fucking cancer and alcoholism and and addiction and just just and I got very good at just (laughs) laughing and smiling and let's do another joke yeah. Um, you know, let's let's just let's keep going. Let's just it'll be fine, you know, and you kind of get you kind of get good at pushing it down and, and ignoring it, you know. Um not realizing that it it's it doesn't for me it, it didn't go away, yeah. you know, it just built up and built up and built up and then you know, it, it got to a point a few years ago it's like I I don't think I can I don't think I can live like this anymore as a, as a human. I just, it just felt like I'd been through so much that, um, that I did, there was no, you know, I just felt there wasn't a human shouldn't suffer that much. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to do something about it, you know, and that, that was, I never realized I had ADHD until three years ago, you know, ADD and, um, you know, getting that diagnosed, I was like, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of, the way I react to noises and pressure and, uh, you know, I'm not good at, I'm not good with people or, you know, I work well under pressure. I need lists. I need a, you know, I can't deviate from a plan. I, you know, I try to control everything and, you know, even now, like today, I'll get up at fucking 3am and make a cake and then I'll drink 10 coffees and go and paint for an hour. And then the kids get, you know, it's like, I do feel superhuman with it, but there, there's there comes a very, uh, very dark side to that too, you know. Yeah. What do you What do you do with that? Because I, I I deal with that too, where I'm just overwhelmed. I can't. You know, when you say you have a plan, you have to stick to that plan. When somebody goes, well, what if we do this? I'm like, that gives me anxiety. Wait a minute, you're talking yeah. about changing the plan up. So how do you deal yeah. with that? It's like you know, I take you know, I take something, but uh, is it something that you know you have to work on or be conscious of? And then uh, would- yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, this is all part of my issue in terms of, you know, there's an element there of of, of of control that I need to feel safe, you know. Um but part of part of, of, of me not being so sad and, and self destructive and, and is about letting letting go and trust in that. All right, you know, let's see. I haven't got the answer, so Let's just see how it plays out because it it affects everyone around me. You know, it's also I'm also aware. Again, into that weird loop, I'm aware that it's really unattractive and ugly to be fucking sad all the time and to be depressed and to want to control things and want to make people do what I want to do. And oh, oh, don't do it like this. You'll be better. You'll be happier if you do this. If you if you listen to what I say, you'll be happy, and then I'll be happy. You know, it's yeah. it's tiring for people. It's exhausting. For my partner, for my lady, it, it's it's it costs me uh, a marriage. You know, and it's I you, you, I I become very aware that it's it's really fucking ugly and it's really hard to live with. And then that, of course, triggers off. Why are you with me? Why are you? You know, and 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 that's when you know, as as a you know someone who has depression and and other bits and pieces going on upstairs, it's it's you then start to trigger yourself and that's when you know you can really fuck yourself up yeah and you don't drink anymore right i don't no i don't do anything i mean i haven't drunk for eight for 
ages, really. Um, I just, you know what, I mean, literally every big fight or argument I've ever had with a partner, a girlfriend, has been because we've been pissed, you know. And it just got to a point, it's like, I just don't, I don't need it, you know. My mum and sister both died of alcoholism, so I'm aware that it's there, it's in my family, you know. So it was like, fuck that, I don't need it, you know. Yeah, you know. Because it's, it's that thing, it's, you know, and I can recognise that thing in myself where because of, I, I, I don't mean to sound like a dick, but because obviously I've achieved a certain level of success on the TV, you're kind of well known. I'm kind of well known over here, so I tend to to not drink in the evenings. So I'd go and be in the pub at one in the afternoon, you know, and then I'd sit there until six or seven, and then when people started to come in, then I'd leave. But then you'd be leaving with eight cans of Budweiser and a bottle of wine, and you know you'd finish that, and you think, oh, what have I got in that cupboard? You know what I mean? It just was never enough, right? And I think at that point you start to think. Okay, I see. I see what's happening. I see what's happening here. Yeah, I mean, look, most people write a book, a, a book, a memoir when they're like Betty Davis, when they're in their seventies yeah, right. or their eighties, right? But I was like, this guy must have lived a fucking life if he's writing a book. You have the memoir that came out a couple of years ago, Truths, Half Truths, and Little White Lies, and you you get into yeah. it all. But what what prompted that? Did you feel like fuck? I've lived. I've got a lot to tell. Maybe I could help someone. What was the reason behind it? Um, yeah, I mean, I just got approached by uh, by the publishers say, "Did you want to? <laughs> did you want to do one?" And I wasn't. Um, I never really thought about it, but I, you know, I think I, I lost my parents. Like, I lost my mum when I was like thirty five, and I lost my dad like twelve years ago, like seven years after my mum. And I was really aware that there were portions of my life. <laughs> Uh, that I had lost forever now because I could never ask them. They they were gone, and I think there was a regret that there were things that I sh- that I didn't ask as a, as a kid because you don't you just don't ask your parents. Yeah, what is that? You never. What, I, I don't feel what comfortable. Are you I, yeah, of what you know? I just never did it. And then there were things, and now I mean, I, I'm not. I don't really. I'm not bothered anymore by it. But I was like, okay, so maybe if I could write down stuff and stuff that my kids could read when they're like older and they're like, Oh, I kind of get a sense of who dad was. He's not just an idiot who did films that we were too young to watch, you know? Right. Right. But it was also quite a, what I kind of liked about, about Hannah who published the book is she didn't want it to be celebrity. I just didn't want it to be a, a kind of, you know, I kind of hate that thing. Well, I'm in a very, uh, I'm always aware that the job we do, puts us in a very kind of uh, a bracket where I, I hate seeing celebrities moaning about you know crocodile shoes that are too tight or they're fucking jet lagged because they just got off a private plane and, <laughs> you know I just think boo fucking who yeah so you want so to, I didn't yeah. want it to be that you know and so I just wrote uh, up until I was 30 so I didn't even do any any of the getting on TV or doing Shaun of the Dead, you know. And I just wanted to, you know, I thought if... if uh, uh, I, I do get a lot of DMs from people to say, hey, I read your book and it, it helped, you know, because it talks about depression, it talks about grief and loss and, you know, I just think Western culture is so shit at dealing with death still. Shit. Like, it's a big fucking surprise and you know, I mean, my kids, I've got a newborn and a three-year-old and a 10-year-old. And Jeez. I will be, I've, I heard of something like ages, years ago, it's kind of stuck with me, like some guy, some like war chief from the, you know, some amazing tribe said that like the point of being a father is to prepare your children for the fact that one day you're going to die. And I was like, oh, Jesus. shit, I kind of get that, you know. Right. And so there's, I mean, it's difficult to do now <laughs> in our kind of society. But, you know, I talk about death a lot with my son, not in a weird kind of creepy, frightening way, but just like, yeah, this is how it is. This is this is part of it, you know. 
Right. So they're very aware the kids. I mean, you, you, you talk to them. Are you, do you feel like you're pretty open? Like was your father when you were growing up, was your father open? Because my father wasn't open at all. I didn't know anything about him. I still don't know anything about him. And so sometimes, yeah. you know, that's just that old school, traditional sort of like, you don't need to know about me. You don't need to be my friend. You know, I'm going to put a roof over yeah. your head and that's fucking it. I mean, you yeah. know, how was your father? My look, well, my old man was, you know, he he was he was a he was an amazing man, you know. He he, I think he had a lot of trouble with. He was a very funny man. He was a great cook. Um, him and my mum were quite romantic and affectionate to one another. Wow. Um, I'd watch them dance sometimes in the kitchen, which was amazing, and. Um, but, but, you know, he had a my, – my mum had a terrible drink problem, so I could see him start to have to cope with that too. And I thought that 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 that, that was quite something, you know. And then my dad, he, he was a, a – he was a really, really clever man. He kind of self-taught himself to be like a – he was an amazing artist and stuff, and he started working at a company where he – upholstered office furniture. Right. And he worked his way all the way to the top to become general manager after 20 years. Just just an incredible man, you know. But he was working with a guy who was the boss of the company who fucking drove a Ferrari and had a massive house. And, you know, I think my dad was looking at him and thinking, why why haven't I got this? You know, we were doing pretty good, but it wasn't this guy, you know. This guy owned the company. So right. everything that we sold, he sold was going to him essentially. And I think he I th- I was like 14, 15, 16 at this point, and he decided that he would go it on his own. Um which which now as a 50 year old I look back and I think A, first of all, it was fucking brave and and B you're an idiot, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> yeah. he had no capital. You right. know, he had to put our house up against the shit he bought to make chairs. You know, right. And so one thing led to another, and that company collapsed. And and with the collapse of that company, excuse me, it meant that uh, people from a bank came and they took our car and they. <sighs> moved us outside of our house. How old they, are you? How old are you at this point? I was 15. My God. And they changed the locks on the house and that was it. We had nothing. And he 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 changed, you know. He had, he had, I mean, I literally then it was, I didn't see him smile for fucking 10 years. I'd never seen my old man cry. And then that's all I saw him do for... I mean, for months, literally for months, you know. I think there was a big thing with him and his generation where he could not do what was imperative for a man to do, and that was to look after your family, to support and provide, you know. And he never got over that, and he never, he was never the same again, you know. Oh, that's got to be devastating. And we got rehoused, you know, the council rehoused us and stuff like that, but it was just, he, it broke him, you know, it really broke him, but you know, 10 years after, 20 years after that, you know, when he was, my mum saw him through that period of years, 10 years, literally, when he couldn't get fucking dressed and he walked the dog for eight hours a day collecting golf balls and selling them to a driving range. You know, that was his job. That's what he did. And my mum saw him through that, you know. But at the same time, wasn't then, she? wasn't she drinking at the same time, though? Yeah, God, yeah, but you know, she was, she was a powerful working class Welsh fucking firebrand, functional and alcoholic, you, like a functional alcoholic. She could function. She could yeah, get shit done. Yeah, I mean, you didn't talk about her drinking. You didn't mention it. You know, that's what that's what we do. <laughs> you know, oh. this is how it is on a sun. You know, right? But then it got to a point where my mum was in a. 50 probably when she suddenly became a very old woman you know she looked like a fucking eight year old and then he he got her through the next 10 years you know they then flipped 
flip their jobs. Right. And I, you know, I remember, I think I remember fucking hating my dad for years and my mum, you know, because I was, I was saying to him, what, you know, what are you, why don't you get up? Why are you crying? You know, I was really mad at that, you know. That, yeah. I was really sad and mad at it. Uh, you know, and then to see him flip and then he, you know, he was like a, it was amazing. It was an amazing thing to see, you know, like essentially, I don't know, just watch, it must be hard to watch your, the love of your life kill herself over 10 years, 20, 30 years and just sit and facilitate it and, you know. Yeah. It's fucking I, hard. You know what's funny is, I don't know, this is not, not funny, but, you know, I, I would have, <laughs> I would have uh, loved to have seen my father cry once. To show right. some emotion, to so, show some vulnerability as a child. It was just always, you get caught drinking, you're going to a halfway house. You do this, you're out of the house. This is the way it is. I never drank. I never did anything. And all of a sudden, it wasn't until my 20s when I went to my dad's old dentist. And I was like, God, did my dad ever drink? Did he ever? Your dad was fucking doing coke. He was <laughs> fucking trashed. He was wiggling his dick out at everybody. He was, you know, all this shit that I found out about my dad later. And I'm like, why did you lie to me? Why are you like this superhero? Um, yeah. You know, and he, I, you know, he, I, I don't, I forgive him, but, you know, at the same time, I would have loved to have seen some vulnerability. I would have loved to have seen some more nurturing, caring, Humanity. loving. Yeah. And you, you got to see probably too much of that in the other direction. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the flip side was once my mom passed away, he, I felt like he became free. I mean, obviously he was very sad. Right. And it was awful, but he, he gained a certain level of freedom, you know. And uh, I, my, uh, my dad only lived for another eight years after my mum died. He died really early too. But, but in, that, in those eight years, you know, he, he fell in love. He found a new lady who oh. was amazing, an amazing woman. And, you know, he... he he got his shit back. He was an art. He was an amazing artist, amazing watercolorist, and uh, he got it. He started. He did it again. I hadn't seen him pick up a paintbrush for twenty five years, and he started again. And I could see him. You know, I think that's probably why when my old man died, it was that was the fucking last thing for me in terms of the straw that broke the camel's mind. You know, right. it was like, okay, so I just got my fucking best friend back, and I've had him for five, six years. And now he's got fucking lung cancer. It's like, dude, you know, yeah, it was too much. Do you think a lot of the art stuff that you do now, I look on Instagram and the beautiful art that you do and the cooking, it's all from the folks, right? It's, you get that from your mom and dad? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's just, um, I think it's a real, I, I don't know. There's, you see a lot of people in our job who are fucking terribly, who sh are terrible show offs. You know what I mean? Right. And I'm not, I'm like, oh my god, sit down, shut up! Or <laughs> there's a particular—I I can't say—but there's a particular YouTube clip of this actor, and he's on like a talk show, and all of a sudden he's like doing a selection of dances and impressions, and I'm like, oh my god, like I can't not watch it, but at the same <laughs> time, I—I I just hate it so much. It's like, are you desperate? You're desperate for coverage, but so I've never felt that, you know. Right. But in the kitchen, I can—I can fucking. Like we had friends around today, and I just, I like, an, I made an amazing like plum and almond tart, and it's it's fucking great. It's like that's <laughs> that's my chance to show off slightly, you know? right? So you love you love cooking, you love art, you love you're a homebody. You like to be at home. Yeah, I do. Yeah, because I think it's a skill to cook now. I mean, yeah, you know, not I mean, not that many cook. Obviously, loads of people cook, but it's not it's not. I mean, it's not massive that people can sit and cook but you know a di dinner every every night of the week or you know so I th i'm kind of proud that there's a and i you know my 10 year old does stuff in the kitchen too it's like i think that's a real good skill to have you know inside of you is brought to you by fairway fairway meat market company is a family-owned grocery chain and a top 10 employer in iowa it's been in business since 1938 they have the most delicious meats the freshest meats you could possibly imagine. Uh, they mm -hmm. sent me some, and uh, 
I just freaking love it. What'd you make? Uh, well, pork tenderloin. Ooh. Yes, d- delicious and uh, easy to make. Uh, you know, I just throw it on the grill. That's what I do. I throw things on the grill. Ribeyes and uh, all that stuff. They've got the best stuff you could possibly taste in your life, Ryan. <laughs> nice. Uh, fairway meat markets quality meat comes straight from america's heartland premium beef including choice prime and 100 percent full blood wagyu and all natural certified duroc pork is raised by family farmers and sourced straight out of corn country giving you access to the highest quality meat in america you know it's pretty easy ryan all you have to do is visit fairway meat market that's f-a-r-e-w-a-y fairway meat market.com you select your favorite meat products and you stand by your grill waiting to f- throw that slab of meat on there and have a little tasty dinner or lunch or snack. Ooh, You know what I mean? Very nice. This week, my listeners can get the Butcher's Holiday Collection valued at $275 for just $169.99 plus free shipping when entering inside at checkout. The Butcher's Holiday Collection package includes two 12-ounce USDA choice ribeye steaks. Two 8-ounce USDA choice filet mignons. Two 8-ounce USDA choice sirloin filets. Four 8-ounce 100% full-blood Wagyu patties. Six 8-ounce certified Duroc boneless pork chops. And two pounds of private labeled bacon. That's more than $100 off the best meat in America this holiday season, plus free shipping nationwide. That's fairwaymeatmarket.com, promo code INSIDE, and look for the Butcher's Holiday Collection. Codes give free shipping site-wide as well, not just on the select package. That's fairwaymeatmarket.com, promo code INSIDE, and look for the Butcher's Holiday Collection. Inside of you is brought to you by Geico. Uh, I've talked to you guys about Geico before. Um, I'm all about comfort. I'm all about easy. I'm all about, hey, if I'm, I don't want to go to the grocery store, I want people to deliver groceries to me. I've got a lot going on in my life. And you know what? You've got a lot going on in your life. Ryan? Yeah. So wh- what can you do? It sounds like you're in the, the market for a bundling policy. That's, you're damn right I am. I'm in the mood for a bundling policy, policy, these, policy. This, these holidays. <laughs> Do you understand? Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. Why not be good to yourself uh, on the holidays? Just go to Geico. Get a quote. See how much you could save. It's Geico easy, folks. These wonderful bundling policies make it easy for one payment and great deals. Geico.com. Go there today. That's Geico.com. Even a Rosenbaum can do it. You know, it sounds like you had a pretty good childhood, but you, there was a lot of bad luck around you. There was a lot of shit yeah, that happened. Yeah. So it was one of those things where you loved your mom, you loved your dad. He worked hard. They went through some ruts. And I know, you know, I lost my sister uh, two years ago. She she passed away. She was 14 and she was sick her whole <laughs> life. But I know that you lost yeah. your sister when you were 10 years old and she was, she was 18 and that had to be yeah. just, I mean, to tear a family apart. That's that. How did you, how did that happen? I mean, she had an asthma attack. Yeah, she did. She was, um, she was a, an amazing singer and songwriter. And she was just about, cause she was from my dad's first marriage. So when my dad and her mom got divorced, they went and lived in New Zealand. And uh, so she was kind of about to break over there, you know, and uh, she did a gig one night and she came back and and she just was on her own and started to have a massive asthma attack and just never couldn't, you know, couldn't alert people and, and passed away, you know. And uh, it was just, uh, it's one of those, it was one of those things that I can't sit in a room now without the television on. Um, it, it it doesn't have to have any sound on, but the TV has to be on. And that, I think that is a remnant of, of we were at my auntie Marion's house staying there when we found, when we found out, but having to come down, um, and the TV was off, you know, my mum and dad were just sat just, just silently, you know, it was like, Oh fuck. What's, what is, what is it as a 10 year old? I'm like, what is this? What's happening here? You know, Jesus. And so, you know, it's, an, it's a really odd thing because after that, you know, my my brother Mark died when I was 30 
And then Good God. two years later, my sister Debbie died. And then uh, my mum died two years after that. And then my dad died. And then another brother, uh, Ian, all in the space of 10, 10 years, essentially. And it's, you know, I, I kind of got really good at the fucking admin of it. The admin of grief, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, well, I feel like this and we'll do this and let's book a car for these people and let, is there a, let's phone this florist. And, but I, never necess, I didn't necessarily got to deal with the other bits and pieces of, of that, you know. Yeah, you were sort of like almost facilitating like, okay, this is what we got to do. Someone's got to step up. I'm going to get this. I'm going to go to the florist. Yeah. I'm going to do this and, and I'm going to keep everything together. Here we go. But inside keep- you're ripped apart. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Keep just keep going forward. <laughs> that was my Fuck, that that's... was my thing for so many years. Just keep going. Yeah, well, I mean, you have to you have to keep going forward. I mean, you stop, you're kind of fucked, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. In the end, it, yeah. But that was it just it just fucking crippled me mentally in the end. It was like it was just too much. Also, cuz you kind of you get a certain level of success with films you do and you know, you go to work and, you know, people at work always see the best possible Nick Frost. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I fucking love it. I love being on a set and I love the focus pullers and I love the costume guys and getting my hair cut and I love it all, you know. Um, I'm, I'm there for literally every lens change. I love watching him do it. You know, I love <laughs> them marking up there. Sure. You know, so to then, and to be fairly, and and to be successful in doing that job, you know. Yeah. To then have to come home (laughs) or, you know, you have an, people have an assumption that you're a fucking laughing billionaire, you know. Yeah. But it's just not the case. It's like, yeah, you know, you come home and you're. Your life is fucked. <laughs> I always say I was sort of like, you know, it's like the clown. You, you're up there you're with a the big smile on your face on set. And everybody's like, oh, it's Nick. Oh, it's Rosenbaum. Oh, they're just fucking happy. Look at them. They're so funny. They're doing stand-up. God, these guys are so funny. And you go home, you go, I hate myself. Yeah. I fucking hate my life. I, what is that? I mean, yeah. I, I went through years and years of that where I just was like, I give so much to everybody. But when I got home, I was all alone. I always felt like alone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, that's, um, I think that's, it's a really, um, it's really, it's really fucking crippling. It's really spirit crushing to give so much, you know. And I think that's also part of uh, 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 the diagnosis that we have as people with ADHD. You know, we're, I think we're people, I'm a people pleaser, you know. Oh, yeah. I never realized that the simplest thing was, I all I needed to do was just to be happy myself <laughs> and that would make my kids happy and that would make my wife happy yeah I never imagined that that that's how simple it was I just even as a fucking 48 year old man you know what I mean just <laughs> literally smashing doors down to make people happy and yeah. it never did because they could see inside that I was just fucking lonely and sad what is it that fixes us? I mean, people like us out there that um, you learn to love yourself. You learn to just say, all right, this is it. This is what I've been given. And I've made a lot of people happy, and I've got to learn to love myself. It's easier said than done. But to be able oh to look God, yourself yeah. in a fucking mirror and go, I fucking love that guy. He's awesome. That's fucking Time hard. Time for my affirmations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you do that? Do you do your gratitudes, or do you do things like that? Or yeah, Well, yeah, I mean... I do. I mean, I, I've, uh, I think I've learned a lot over the last three years in terms of me and, and ha- how destructive I am as a person, you know, and how, how fragile it is too, how fragile I am and, and it was. And, um, and it, I think you get to a point, I certainly got to a point where someone said to me, uh, like a really young woman, like in her 20s, said to me, like, you have suffered enough. You you don't need to suffer anymore, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh <laughs> you my start God, you're crying. So yeah, right. you're so completely right. You know, and I think I don't know. There's a few a few things, and I think my my 
my seven-year-old, he was seven then, but him just kind of sitting next to me and putting a little hand on my arm and, and saying, are you all right, Dad? It was like, fuck, I can't, you know, it's, uh, that's what I live for and, and, and work, work to try and avoid him ever looking like that again, you know. Yeah, how, giving yourself, you, 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 you have purpose. Afraid. You have purpose. Yeah. He's your purpose, yeah. you know. Oh, fuck, yeah. Children yeah. are your purpose. Absolutely. All three of them. Yeah. What All ma- three of the little a-holes. <laughs> All the little bastards. <laughs> um, did you, what was it that got you into sort of acting and like, you know, just like, what, what was it that you felt like, I this is what I need. This is what I'm going to gravitate towards. Or I'm, I'm good at this. Am I, am I quick-witted? There's something about me that's different that I think I could be successful about this. For, with this, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I just, no, I mean, I, I was always just a fucking funny idiot at school. You know, um, I was like, like a, uh, I was like a like a weird kind of stunt man. I'd like fall off a wall, or <laughs> I'd run into a garage door, or I'd do a big stunt on my bike, or and I was cheeky and funny and. You know, just that, that everything you do to try and cover up being lonely as a child, right? Uh, and afraid. And but I was funny, you know. I, I lived at when I was like 18, 19, I lived in Palestine for two years and I made people laugh and I was good at it. And I was a, and I was a waiter for years and I was really good at that. So I was funny and smart and I made loads of tips. And, and I never, my, honest to God, never wanted i never thought about not once did i get to a point of saying oh fuck what am i gonna do you know i just never i just never thought like that really uh, not that i didn't think i just never thought like that. my parents never pushed me right they never said oh now you need to go to college or you know i left school at six six just 16 i turned so and then went to work at a company um like a shipping company selling containers um I was always the funniest fucker, you know. Right. And I think it was only when I was at at Chiquito's Mexican bar and restaurant that I kind of met Simon. And and I never realized, I never knew stand-up was a thing. I'd never, I mean, I had seen films, but I didn't know what cinema was. Right. You know, I didn't know (laughs) you could get paid for telling jokes or telling stories or being funny, being an idiot, you know. And so I met Simon and, and we just made each other laugh just all the time. As, you know, it was just, and he said, you, why don't you go and try and do some stand up? And so I thought, yeah, well, fuck it. Let me, yeah, let me, <laughs> let me do that, you know. And I, I did 12 gigs and uh, six were amazing. And six were like the lowest point of my <laughs> of life. Of course, just, yes. <laughs> I think I'd rather bury my mum again than do some of those gigs. <laughs> 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 they were just really bad, you know. And I did, it just wasn't for me. I just felt like it wasn't. I didn't know what it. You know, I never realised that. I just wanted to be great immediately because I can make everyone laugh in the pub. Yet, right. I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. I didn't realize it was a fair skill. And, you know, you, you, you do it for years before you get good at it. Right. And you didn't want to spend the years with your ADD. You couldn't spend years to get good at it. You're like, I'm not taking this time. Uh, yeah. No. Um, also, it was like suffering with anxiety of being around loads of people. And it took a lot out of me. You know, I was yeah. like, I'd have a big headache afterwards and, I just didn't like it because I was thinking about it all day and I felt like that feeling you get before having going to have a shot, you know, I was like, well, I got to do a fucking gig. You know, I hated it. Just feeling like like you have to take a shit all the time. (laughs) The nerves, you have to take a fucking, as you called it once, a Yankee long, you Uh, know? Yes. But you know, that's the thing. uh, Yeah. It's like I'd just been spent the day eating steak and cake and then having to push that out of me <laughs> and you feel like uh, that all the time just performing and getting on stage at 11 o'clock at night i know i've done it too i did stand up for about i probably did it for about almost a year and every time i go why do you put yourself through this and then all of a sudden you hear the applause and you're like because i love that but i hate everything up to that i hate everything yeah. up to the point of actually everyone laughing the whole yeah. day just feels like shit 
I'm yeah. nervous. Yeah. I have to be great. I, I put too much pressure on myself. But I still have that now before every acting gig I, I've ever done. Um, I do too. I will be up all night shitting myself and being sick and just being fucking frightened of, of, of uh, you know, I think it's changed now, but but now it's about a fear of failure, you know, a fear of not knowing my dialogue and, and fucking the production up and everyone hate, you know what I mean? Same fucking thing. Why is it that the older we get, the more we give a shit, the more we're worried about failure? We weren't that worried about failure when we were younger. No, no, no. But I've, I've worked with a few actors, really big actors, who come onto the set and and didn't know any dialogue and had to be fed line after line after line and laughed laugh throughout and, and then just <laughs> went home and I was like, you lucky prick. They just Imagine don't care. just feeling like that confident and, you know. But yeah, I mean, I just got, after knowing Simon and stuff, we... He wrote a show. He wrote a show with Jessica Hines called Space. Right. He said, I just want you to come and come and be a character. I used to do this character. And he just said, why don't you come and do come and do this character, you know? And uh, yeah, that was it, really. Uh, that was that was 20 odd years, 22 years ago. So if you never met Simon, what would you be doing right now? <clears throat> I think I would be the area manager of a chain of Mexican restaurants. And you'd probably, probably be okay with it. I'd probably run six restaurants in the southeast, <laughs> and I'd have like a nice co company car. And what's wrong with that? If I, nothing. Low pressure gig. Right. And you love cooking. Oh my god! Yeah. But you met Simon, it. and everything fucking changed, and you started doing all these movies. Do you? Obviously, Shaun of the Dead was like the first real big one, right? Yeah. Did you have any idea that that was going to be as much of a success as it was? Um, fuck no, no, I don't know, no, not at all. I mean, you know, we, we've always, to a to a certain extent, we've always tried, especially the films me and Simon made, uh, Paul as well, and Cuban Fury, and and then the ones I did with Edgar and Simon. It, it's it was about making our, us laugh and making our mates laugh mm. and. And just a group of friends who just wanted to have fun and make a film and have a laugh. And, you know, we love zombie films and now we get a chance to make our own zombie film. And we love cop film and now we're making hot fires. And I think it was only when when we did the the what, the American press tour for Hot Fuzz, I think did we realise how successful Shaun of the Dead had been, you know. Right. Because it was like when we did our tour for, we did such massive press tours for these films. You wouldn't do them these days, but like for Shaun of the Dead, we did 28 American cities in 35 days or something like that, you know. Wow. And then for Hot Fuzz, we did exactly the same thing. And for World's End, funnily enough. But like when we went to do Shaun of the Dead, we'd come to introduce the screening and no one would really clap or would know us. And you'd get a few people saying, whoa, space. And, <laughs> but then afterwards they'd love the film so people would go bonkers right but it was when we did Hot Fuzz when we had to go and introduce the film every night the cinemas were fucking rammed and everyone went absolutely mental every time we went to introduce a screening and it was like whoa you know people fucking love Shaun of the Dead Shaun of the Dead one of my favourites I've seen it a hundred times I'm a big I'm a big horror movie fan if you came to my house you'd see Return of the Living Dead, Fright Night, Evil Dead posters. That's just kind of like who I am. You know, I yeah, love that stuff. I love it. Yeah. Um, do you think that it's it's sort of like, do you miss that camaraderie that just trying to make each other laugh on set? And then what happens is inadvertently or ultimately you get famous and then people start wanting you in their own projects. But now you're not working with these same people who you live off of and, and, and yeah. riff off of. And does that kind of, do you kind of like when you're on another movie set, you're probably like, I want every movie set to be like Shaun of the Dead. I want the jokes to always be coming, and they're not always like that. Yeah, look, I w I'm going to say no. I mean, as much as I, I mean, I love working with Edgar and Simon, and I would be nothing without those films, and 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 without the the chance and and the gamble that those guys took on me as a performer. You know, never having acted before. You know, I, I, I'm aware that I'd kind of, I'd be, I'd be the 
area manager of six Chiquitos Mexican <laughs> restaurants right now. Right. But, you know, it's it's also when you're friends like that and, and the more films you do, the more money you can give them to make the films, the pressure gets more and more and more. So, right. you know, friendships creak. It's difficult, you know. And I, uh, it's, I, I, it's easier to make films without Simon um, because it's like... Uh, I think being being a sidekick, this is like my big chip on my shoulder, being a sidekick and a wingman, it's very difficult to be taken as anything but that for things, you know. And so I think I've spent, I think successfully, the last 10 years or so, trying to move myself away from that. Right. Um, I'm very grateful for it, but, you know, I thought there was potentially... I felt I could do more as a character actor. Um, I felt I had it in me, you know. I didn't want to just have all that fucking death in my life and then not use it. Right. Uh, or use it just to sell kind of little bits of weed to, uh, you know, Ed's friends. Right. So, you know, it's also difficult because it's... We work hard when we did those films. We weren't... There, was, there wasn't much laugh. I mean, it was great to do and it was fun and... But you're busting but your ass. It was fucking hard, you know. Yeah. There's, we just worked. We worked, we worked, we worked. Because Edgar, you know, unfortunately, we all shared a similar work ethic in terms of let's fucking get it done. Let's do this, you know. Right. Yes, it was fun. But the rehearsals were always fun because then it was loose and we had time. And and if something was funny and we all laughed, it would go in. And then that would be the shooting script you'd use. And then we only ever shot that. We didn't improvise. We didn't, you know. But you, yeah, I mean, I, I also like the fact that Edgar and I and Simon and I have evolved. Our friendships have evolved, and because of that, they they have survived. And there is, you know, there is mu- there is as much love there now as there was, excuse me, when we were thirty. But now it's like I have three kids. I have a, a partner. We have right. my, 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 you know, my. It, 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 your focus changes. That's just naturally what happens as you get as you get older, you know. Because mm-hmm. if, if if you if it doesn't, you end up like fucking Simon's character in the World's End. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. What it, what's it like? You know, doing something like Into the Badlands, where you're playing a badass or like playing a character like that. Did you enjoy your experience? And you were in Ireland filming that. Yeah, we were there for two two years on and off. You know, um, I got to say, me and Daniel Wu. And doing that show with Miles and, and now, Al yeah. was the fucking best thing that happened to me. Yeah. I loved that show. I loved shooting it. Um, and the more we did, you know, because the writers were in the States and we were there, you know, sometimes you'd get the scripts and none of it would match up because it's like the guy that wrote four and five isn't the guy that wrote six and seven. So none of it right. would match. So certainly for the second season, or the third season I was in, um, you know, I was getting to do little rewrites and stuff and I'd go to Al and Miles and Daniel and say, hey, I rewrote this scene. What do you think? And they were like, yeah, boom, let's put it in. And wow. So I love the fact I got Al, Al must Al and Miles must really love you to allow you to do that. They're, that well, I'm I telling you, and they did. Yeah, of course. I, I, it was always, you know, I never, it was never, I never said, I, I don't, I'm never, I'm not one of those actors who says, I don't like this or, I don't think my characters would say this. I always say, hey, uh, I'm not sure I said this, but how about this? You know, w- right. what about this? Or take it or leave it, you know, just make people aware that you're, you, you know, your place in the food chain, you know. Right. And if it was always good. It was always good and funny and, and touching and, 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 and relevant, you know. Right. And, and I think that's, I, I think that's a, I think that's something that I really enjoy about my my career is I, I I have a voice on everything I do. Yeah. You know, even now doing the nevers and I'm like number fucking 40 on the call sheet. <laughs> I, I'm still allowed to say, uh, hey, can we, can we, you know, can we try this? Or what about this as an alt? Or, you know. That's nice to have that freedom where people respect you and know that you're capable of doing that. So they kind of trust you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. But also, similarly, there's lots of actors there. You know, there were people on Into the Badlands, as, as beautiful as they were, and, and they were great at martial arts and acting. They, If they didn't like something, they'd just say it. You know, they'd just say the words. It's like, 
Well, you don't have. I mean, you you, you could change it. You know, just don't moan about it. Change it. Right. This is called yeah. shit talking with Nick Frost. It's it's rapid fire questions. You can answer them. As, okay. But this is from my lovable patrons. If you want to join Patreon, patreon.com slash inside of you. Uh, support the podcast. Uh, Michelle K, are the rumors about you being the next Doctor Who true? Also, who is your favorite Doctor Who? Or who gives a shit? Uh, okay, so uh, I have two favorite Doctor Whos. Tom Baker, because he was around when I was, you know, 10, 12. And um, uh, I really love Matt Smith and, and Capaldi too. I think those guys were great. Um, I I I did a th- or like someone I saw something on Twitter the other day. Like one of the geek uh, websites did a thing. Thirty actors who we potentially could see playing Doctor Who, and like I wasn't I didn't make that whole list, and so I was so enraged that I even like put a thing on saying. Did I not really make that list at all? <laughs> uh, I don't think. I mean, I, 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 I don't think it off for me. But but uh, you would do it. Do. You would do, do Doctor Who. Yeah, maybe. Fuck it. Why not? Why the fuck not? Emily asks, what's been your favorite project you have done so far in your career? I know there's a lot, and then that's a tough yeah. one. But the one that really comes to mind. Um, okay, so. Into the Badlands was amazing. I really loved doing fighting with my family with Stephen Merchant. I, and I love Stephen uh, too. To, I love him. He's such a great guy. He oh was on my the God, podcast. He was great. Every, all the cast was amazing. We all wrestled. It was just like, do you know when you, it's just like, you know when you hit a tennis ball perfectly and you can't feel it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is fucking great. We could improvise. We could do what we want and, there was kind of I loved it. It was great. It was like a love. I got to have a mohawk as well. It was like I a loved lovely it. three months. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed that a lot. That was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, Omar. I love the world's end. Any funny stories behind the scenes to that? A funny story. Fucking hell. I mean, um, I never really wanted to hit the stunt men when we were doing the fights. I didn't like hitting them. <laughs> and then like Edgar's kind of a sadist. So, like, he'd come over just before, like, when we were doing the fight scenes and stuff. He'd say, hey, listen, I really want you to hit him this time. You really got to hit him. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, and so, like, that, and then, you know, there'd be, you'd see him, like, laying on the floor and having, like, smelling salts. And and then, yeah, I kind of got my, like, Brad Allen, who, who did a lot of the fighting, uh, who sadly died recently, you know. Um, he, he was... Uh, one of um, Jackie Chan's guys, you know, and he gave me the nickname, the white Samo hung. And uh, I don't think I'll ever forget that. You don't like watching your, uh, your stuff, do you? <sighs> you know, I mean, it's, what's the point? I mean, cause sometimes you're really funny and you could be like, wow, you know, I'm really good in that. I'm, I'm enjoying what I did in this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, look, I mean, I watch bits. I watch little bits and pieces, and I think, okay, that's cool. Or, you know, I did. Um, I did a. We made a show called Truth Seekers a couple of years. Ago, yep. And that was the first thing I'd ever watched when I saw like the assembly for episode one. That was the first thing I ever watched all the way through and didn't cry <laughs> in terms of saying, "Oh my god, what have you done?" You know, but just being hypercritical. And again, that's that thing. It's like I'd rather not watch myself than put myself through. So I can't change it now. It's done. You know, you made that choice artistically and you have to live with that. Even though I know secretly it's, it's pretty good. You're pretty fucking good. You know? Yeah. You know, you're good. There's a confidence in that. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. What's the one. I mean, with, yeah, doing, doing why women kill with Alison Tolman and stuff. There was lots of lovely acting there. You know, I was like, there was a few times working with older actors who come in to do like, smaller characters who were like proper Broadway actors. And and also I did a, I did a film with a, a TV show with Olivia Coleman a while ago. And like me and her got to do like a fucking 12 page drama scene together. It was like, you have that thing where you just, I was watching it and I was like, Oh, this is fucking, this is great. You know, but that, 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 those are the things, those are the things I have to hang on to when I hate acting, you know, because it takes so much out of me mentally in terms of, Oh, I'm having to do a diarrhea now. I can't sleep. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm not going to know my dialogue. I'm right. shit. I'm, you know, 
it really takes it out of me in terms of of of, of mentally, you know. Yeah. But of course, once you get on there and you've done that first rehearsal and you haven't fucked your dialogue up and everything's fine, and then you just start firing as the day goes, you're like, yeah, this is fucking what I pay my money for. So many actors have that. We have that thing where we're shitting our pants. I'm nervous. I can't do this. I don't know why they're going to find out the truth about me. I suck. And then, yeah, then you get on set and you do it a couple of times and then you start to forget about that and you are able to relax a little more, but it's like, but why yeah. do we go through the same shit? Well, why can't we just be like those actors you were talking about that are just fucking just do it and not worry about it. I, I'll never be that yeah. guy. I don't think I'll ever be that guy. I got to accept it. Yes. Yeah. And there's something, there's something there that comes with that level of acceptance in terms of this is my way, this is what I do, and this is how I do it, and it works for me, you know? Yeah. Do you want to be challenged? Do you want to be challenged more? Do you feel like you could, like, do, like, a World War II drama and not be funny at all, just be really dark and, and just... Oh, my God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to, you know? I'd love to do that. I mean, I think... Um, what, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to say something that I don't know, but I just feel like I don't know. I'd like to follow a kind of. I don't. I don't know what I'm saying, but uh, yeah, of course I would. Uh, it's uh, it's a challenge. I like acting, you know. I like it. I like I like feeling these things, you know. I like making people believe that I'm this and I feel that, you know. That's that's a real skill, I think. Do you think you'll ever start your own restaurant, have your own restaurant, have your own thing? Yeah. You do? <laughs> no, I'll fuck that. It's too much like hard work. I don't know, man. The amount you cook and the st you could just see the passion flowing through the internet. You could just see it. But it's a lot. You've got to be there all day. You've got to be there, you know. But if I, you know what? Sometimes I think if I could do, find that one thing, like I sometimes think about, I'm going to use an American term, like a smash burger. Right, right. And fucking just do that. <laughs> right. Two wafer-thin patties with American cheese, <laughs> fried onions, and a nice bun. It's like, boom, five pound a pop. Frost's just Burgers. All day. Frost's Burgers. What would the title be? Don't Choke. Don't Choke Burgers. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's, it's in your... your... One, one in eight of our burgers have a tooth in. <laughs> Oh my god! Hey, this has been awesome, man. I hope you enjoyed this. This I really feel like I got to know you. Like we we've always, we've talked a few times and this and that, but I really I appreciate you opening up. And what what do you got going on next? Anything that we can look forward to? Well, look, we just had a baby, so I mean, fortunately, <laughs> I'm in a position where I can say I would like five months off now. You know, COVID <laughs> certainly helped with that. So yeah, listen, we me and my girlfriend are at a point where. We do the same thing every single day. <laughs> and it's been that for three months, you know. And we're just in a we're just in a vibe where we're just it's just parenting. And there's something quite nice in that too. You know, so um I read a book, I read a kid's book, which I'm editing now. Um, and then I paint a lot too. So I've got a few big things coming across to LA to show in a gallery and bits and pieces. Can you know? people buy your work? Can they buy your yeah, art? Yeah, where where, where can they buy your art? Um, to be TBC. I'm between galleries right now. But okay, but, good. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to. I'm working out some stuff, but I I really love painting. So yeah, you know, I love it. Last, lastly, uh, can I just say something? Yeah, I the thing that I liked about you, Michael, when we met uh, in, when we did Australia. It's I just kind of loved your naughtiness from the get-go. <laughs> and it's kind of rare in, in in humans that you just meet someone and you just get them straight away. And I think that's why I've always had a keen affinity and uh, a fondness for you because I'm like, yeah, I mean. Well, I look, man, I love you. I really appreciate that. And I, I felt the same way. In fact, my buddy Tom, who was there with me, said, tell Nick I said hi, but he won't remember me. But still, you have that sort of presence that people gravitate towards. I I, I just wanted to be around you. You're, you're such a likable. Uh, well, well, you're such a likable guy. I really innately just feel that way about you. And I I liked you all, uh, you're right off the bat. And I was like, I, I want to hang with this guy. How can I hang right. with him? He's just, I just Me feel like you still do that thing every now and again, where I don't know if you remember, but you went, you take that guy's microphone and then 
you'd activate the PA and the whole convention. You'd say, supernova. <laughs> Uh, we say that a lot. <laughs> supernova. Yeah, Supernova was a convention we did in Australia, and I would take the, the mic and just start uh, talking into it and yelling Supernova, and uh, they got a kick out of that. But uh, By the way, lastly, a question you've been asked a million times. Will you ever do another movie to add to the Cornetto trilogy? Yeah, fucking, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, of course we will. I don't know when, but yeah, we will. I mean, uh, listen, what I'd say about this, just to close, is I love the fact that when we started making these films, we were 28, 29, and now we're in our 50s, and soon we'll be fucking 60-odd. So I, it's, a, it's, it's really rare that you get to see characters age with the actors. Yeah. And I think we, we've, we've been given a chance to, to do that, you know, and I think, I think it will be interesting to see what, what comes next, you know. Well, I, I've loved this. Ryan, did you enjoy this? Ryan's my engineer over there that you can't see. It's hey, Ryan. <laughs> hey, Nick. This was great. This hey, has been man. fantastic. Yeah, thank you so um, much, well, man. I'll, I'll be in touch with you, and I really appreciate you you doing this for me. This is uh, this has been a real treat for me, man. Yeah, listen, thank you, mate. I appreciate it. Yeah, give Haley my love, will you? Thanks, man. I'll All see right. you later. Lots of love. Bye. Lots of love. I mean, a lot happened in the episode. I mean, he really talked about how he moved in with Simon Pegg, how he had no money, how his sister passed away at a young age. Uh, he was a big drinker. He was, uh, he, you know, he'd be content having a food truck, you know. <laughs> um, just a genuine guy, man. I, I, I really enjoyed having Nick on the podcast, and uh, I hope you did too. So if you like this podcast, please subscribe on YouTube or Stitcher or Apple or Spotify. Um, you could follow us again at Inside You Podcast on um, Instagram and Facebook and at mm -hmm. Inside You Pod on the Twitter. Uh, I really appreciate all of you listening and uh, thank, thank Nick Frost for being on the podcast. It was great. He's calling us from lovely London. Lovely or, London. Or whatever hell we, where he was. Boggy I mean, London town. Yeah, in London. Um, if you want to uh, shop on the Inside of You, go to the Inside of You online store. We've got. Uh, We've got inside of you uh, mugs. We've got inside of you shirts. We've got uh, Lex Luthor pictures to sign. We've got uh, some small little lunch boxes left, mm -hmm. and uh, the band. Um, the band is Sunspin. If you go to sunspin.com, uh, you can look up for upcoming shows, and you could also get some really cool swag. There's some really great merch. You could book a Zoom with me and Rob, and chat with us, and uh, all all that sort of stuff. So thank you, and again. If you want to join Patreon, patreon.com slash inside of you. I can't thank these guys enough who give back to the podcast and keep us afloat. Let me read off their names. Do it. Nancy. D. Leah. S. Trisha. F. Sarah. V. Little. Lisa. U. Kiko. Jill. E. Brian. H. Mama Lauren. G. Nico. P. Jerry. W. Robert. B. Jason. W. Kristen. K. Amelia. O. Allison. L. Raj. C. Joshua. D. Emily. S. CJ. P. Damn, you're good, dude. Samantha. M. Jennifer. N. Stacy. L. Jen. Ugh. Take a wild guess. C. S. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Jamal F. Janelle B. Kimberly E. Mike E. Eldon Supremo. 99 more. Ramirez Santiago. M. M is correct. Sarah F. Chad W. Leanne. P. Janine. R. Maya. P. Maddie. <laughs> um... S. Yes, Belinda. Uh, N. Chris. F. No, H. H. And Dave. Who's between that? Dave H. Yes, mm. Spider Man. Uh, two. No. <laughs> Chase. Yes, <laughs> Sheila. Um, G. Correct. Brad. D. Ray. A. H. Correct. Tabitha. T. Liliana. M. A. A. Michelle. B. K. K. Michael S. Talia M. Betsy D. Claire M. Laura L. Chad L. Rochelle. Nathan E. Marion. Meg K. Janelle P. Trav L. Dan L. Dan N. Big Stevie W. Angel M. Rhiannon C. Corey K. Super Sam. Coleman G. Deb Nexon. Michelle A. Liz I. Jeremy C. Andy T. Cody R. Sebastian K. Gav. Benader. Correct. David C. John B. Brandy D. Yavor. Yavor is correct. Camille. Ian. S. All right. Bono, the C, the C, mm -hmm. or LC in Spanish. 
Joey M, Willie F, Christina E, Adelaide N, Jeffrey M, Omar I, Lena N, Design OTG, Eugene and Leah, Chris P, Nikki G, Corey, KTB, Patricia, and Maria N. And oh, is it Marla? Is that Marla N? I think it's Marla. Uh-oh. I'm going to say Marla N and Maria N, just oh. in case. All right. But uh, hey, guys. Thanks for thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for tuning in. Um, gosh, I wish I had more to say, but I really don't. Other than um, another fun podcast, another fun interview for me. I'm hope hopefully you uh, you enjoyed it yourselves. And uh, from myself, Michael Rosen, I'm here in the Hollywood Hills of California. Myself, Ryan Tails. <laughs> <laughs> we love you guys. Thank you for joining us and spending some time with us. Thank you for allowing me to be inside of each and every one of you. Be good to yourself. Please be good to yourself. I'm going to try and be good to myself. Let's breathe. <sighs> Take care. <laughs>